Oh, kia ora. Um, can I add my welcome uh, to you all? Um, I don't know why you've come out on such a beautiful day to, to sit for a few hours in, in a hall to, to talk about drugs. I, I suspect the reason that you're here um, isn't because you know, some of you will have a, you know, a connection to this issue. I, I suspect you're here because all of you uh, have a connection to this issue. You know, the, the, the problems associated with drugs. And that might be because yourself, um, you yourself have, uh, have a lived experience, um, uh, have used drugs and have experienced harms and are in recovery. And if you are, congratulations, well done. Um, but I suspect there's a good chunk of you who are here because right now there's someone in your family who is causing crisis uh, and you're you know, and you're facing that challenge. Uh, so strength to you for that. So we're here um, to talk about drugs, but in particular drug law. And we're an organisation, the New Zealand Drug Foundation, we've been around for about 30 years and we're Wellington based. A lot of the work that we do is to provide uh, information and resources to, to parents, uh, to the wider community, to schools, um, uh, about uh, problems associated with alcohol and other drug use and ways that you can reduce those problems. But we're also based in Wellington and because of that we take the opportunity to talk uh, about policy as well. And we see our role in trying to help government and its agencies make good choices, make good decisions, whether it's in the policies they have and the laws that they make or the resources they invest um, into this problem. And Gilbert keep mentioning the word political, and at, at the root of it there are some political you know, issues here. But we also have a view that there probably isn't a lot of sunlight between us, particularly when it comes to, to, to the, the politics. I suspect that there's more uh, commonality than there is difference. And so one of the things we want to do this morning is to, is to have a conversation with uh, the members of parliament um, who are here uh, around that, not to have a debate about my position is better than yours, but to try to unpick areas of commonality and to try to find some consensus around this. Because again, you're here for a reason, it's because you're concerned about New Zealand's drug problem. We don't see issues around drug law in isolation to wider issues. We think there should be resources going to prevention. We think there should be resources going to treatment. We think police have a role in this as well to protect our communities. But the law is also important. The law doesn't stand alone. And I'm going to give you a, a, a quick history lesson. We have a view that the law creates the culture by which we address things. And the law that we have, New Zealand's drug law, is now over 40 years old. I'm almost as old as our drug law. No, actually I'm older. So we have a drug law that's 40 years old. The Misuse of Drugs Act was passed in 1975. And back then the people that passed that law genuinely thought that approaching the drug problem through a criminal justice way, arresting people for possession and use and manufacture and so on, was going to be the best way to reduce our drug problems. I think 40 years on, fast forward 40 years, and you can see that that actually hasn't quite, that hasn't quite worked. And in fact, when that law was being debated in the House back in 1975, a lot of the debate was around the need to put resources into education, prevention and treatment. And that didn't happen. So what we see with our law is when you pass the law, things happen. Resources go uh, into enforcing the law. So I think there's, there's, there's three problems I want to identify with our drug law. One of them is the fact that resources follow the law. So you pass a law, you give powers to police, 
and police uh, therefore have have to be resourced to you know to, to to find breaches in the law and then related to that you've got to arrest people then put them before the courts and then you've got to put them in prison or or some other sort of correctional option and so a lot of resource goes into supporting the law so it will probably shock you actually it may not surprise you at all to know that we spend that this government spends and previous governments have spent more money on police drug law enforcement than on all alcohol and drug treatment combined and that's just the police that's not the courts and prisons and so on so resources we think are taken uh, out of the community uh, and given to to drug law enforcement and resources should actually be kept in the community our drug law is a criminal law you break the law you get a criminal conviction and that's no light matter so the law itself creates a lot of harm yes you might in the eyes of society have done bad but you get a conviction under our drug law and that conviction is going to last a lifetime that might be quite a big conviction you might have been responsible for for shipping over the half ton of, of methamphetamine or you could have just been busted for some cannabis or traded cannabis you know within your within your whanau but you get a conviction under our drug law and that's going to last uh, a lifetime and i think when you start unpicking that gilbert talked about some of the stats so 40 percent of people in prison are in there for for because of drugs with, with drug convictions that's a big you know that's a big number and there are lots of other people who aren't in prison who, who, who receive drug convictions. And think about what that means. You try to get a job uh, with a drug conviction. I mean, I'll, I'll employ you. It's almost a prerequisite to, to, to work for us, actually. <laughs> I, I, my record's clean. <laughs> I'm not sure, about, not sure about Gilbert's. But you try to get a job with a drug conviction, uh, particularly if you're a young person. Uh, you know, you try to travel. You know, you try to do lots of things, and that that conviction is going to hang over you for for your whole life. So it impacts on the law, impacts on your your social and economic well-being. Importantly, the third reason that we don't like the law, the criminal justice approach to to, to drugs, is that it's a huge barrier, a huge barrier for seeking help. So if people are in trouble with drugs, we hear it all the time, people are afraid to put their hand up for help. Whether it's a perception or reality, they're afraid that if they put their hand up for help, their children are going to be removed from them. You know, or they're going to get dobbed in and therefore get the conviction and, and, and so on. So whether it's true or not, the, the fact that people are worried about putting their hand up for help uh, is a huge problem. We think that there are ways that you can change the law to reduce those barriers, to shift resources to where it's needed, uh, to impact, reduce the impact that a conviction will have on your life, uh, and to remove those barriers for help seeking. And we think that there's lots of models to choose from. I'm not going to, you know, we, we, you can look around the world and see what other countries are doing, and we should be prepared to look at what other countries are doing and, and adopt those models. But we should pr be prepared also just to, to think in New Zealand, you know, what would be a good model for New Zealand? You know, imagine, right now in your head, imagine uh, what a community-based approach to the drug problem would look like. You know, imagine if we had more resources going into when a kid in school got busted for, for weed, that they weren't expelled, that they were in fact kept with an education and, and, and resources put you know, around them. Imagine that if you did have a drug problem, you could get channeled very quickly, you could put your hand up and, and very quickly get help. It's a crying shame in this country. And again, it's not this government. This is a, this is a problem we've had in this country for a long, long time. You, know, you put your hand up for help, and then you put on a waiting list. And you know what, just imagine for a second, everyone's nodding, because I think you, you probably experienced this either yourself or within your own family. You put your hand up for help, you get put on a waiting list, and what are you going to do? You keep using. You know, the moment that someone gets brave enough to put their hand up for help, 
we should be providing that help. And we should pro be providing that help where the need is most. And I know that this community right now is thinking about methamphetamine. You know, it's a, it's a huge problem. It's a huge problem for the, the, the whole country, but it, it, it's, it, it seems to be a problem up here as well. And I'll just give you some numbers. The government employs very clever people. And these very clever people uh, did a piece of work uh, earlier this year trying to put a dollar figure through whatever way they did it. They tried to put a dollar figure on where does harm lie. And it's called the, the drug harm index. They're trying to put a social cost to, to problematic drug use. And this is the, these are the figures they came up with. And if you think about these figures, you can see where you can, you can start to unpick where should our resources be going. So for someone who is dependent on cannabis, and we think cannabis is a drug that causes problems. So someone who is dependent on cannabis under this drug harm index, it's about $30,000 uh, worth of harm. Social harm, harm to themselves. $30,000. Methamphetamine? $116,000. So if we're wanting to start to reduce problems in this country, starting to put resources into helping dependent drug users and particularly dependent methamphetamine users is going to be, you know, good. <laughs> I hate this phrase, but value for, value for money. So think about it. If you were in charge of the system, what would you do? You know, you'd keep people out of the criminal justice system. You'd give them help when they need it. Um, I want to play a, a, a short video, and it, 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 it's, um, it goes to some of the themes that I've just mentioned and that we, we're going to talk about. Uh, and I want to paint a bit of a picture before we play it. So this video is of um, a speech that um, a person called Tuadi Portiki uh, gave um, earlier this year. Uh, Tuadi is the chair uh, of the New Zealand Drug Foundation. So uh, he travelled to New York because he's lucky, um, to the United Nations, where the United Nations uh, got together to talk about the world drug problem. So you're here today, this morning, talking about the drug problem here. The world got together earlier this year to talk about the drug problem. In this speech, I don't know if you, you see it on TV, when world leaders speak at the United Nations, it looks all very grand. So he's on this podium, and in front of him, is 400 people, it's actually more than that, four or 500 people, world leaders, diplomats, ministers of health. So the world is before him. You don't see them, but there's, there's all the world there. Uh, he was invited to speak because of his personal experience around these issues. He was one of the last speakers at the end of a three-day hui. He was grumpy. Uh, so we'll, we'll play his grumpiness. But at the end, he has a message, and I think that this is a good, a, a good question to, to plant in your minds, and particularly to plant uh, in the members of parliament who are here. He says, you know, the problems we're trying to address are to help um, people's sons and daughters. And just think for a, mi a minute, if it was your son or daughter who had, who had a problem, you know, what, what, how would you want them to be looked after? And once you answer that, you know, the, 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 it's a fairly clear um, path forward. 